Welcome to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We are delighted you are here with us. Our favorite day of the week for many reasons, Friday. Friday Ask and Answered with Fundraising Academy. And the cool thing about this uh, day for us is we get different people on every Friday to answer the questions that come in. And so today we have LaShonda Williams coming to us from the great state of Texas, one of the amazing trainers at Fundraising Academy. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. LaShonda, talk to us really quickly about what it means to be a trainer at Fundraising Academy. Like, I don't think we... Uh, we, we've never asked this question, like, what is it that you do? So um, being affiliated with the Fundraising Academy, I tell people often it's very much so an honor. Um, I have an opportunity to lend my expertise and help with building curriculum that aligns with the cost selling cycle, providing practical everyday examples that um, I've had in the philanthropic space, but most importantly, conveying the importance of professional development and how the Fundraising Academy offers a variety of complimentary webinars to help us as we are development professionals hone in on our crafts and become experts. And the icing on the cake for me is that all of the trainings are CFRE eligible. So for those who are interested in securing their CFRE certification, there's a tracking system. So as you're watching the free webinars, I did say free, you have an opportunity to kind of work your way um, in preparation for that professional development requirement that the CFRE um, has in place. I love that you shared that. And then I want really briefly for you to back this up because you're a working development officer. Share with us what you do in your workaday world. Yes. So I am so honored to, to be involved in the professional philanthropic space. I'm currently employed with South Texas College of Law, located here in the greater state of Houston, Texas. We just recently celebrated our centennial anniversary, um, which was filled with a variety of programming to promote alumni engagement and giving. And we culminated the year with a uh, reunion weekend that afforded the opportunity to recognize our alumni, as well as the culmination of a gala, which garnered significant philanthropic support from the greater Houston Metropolitan Committee community, as well as our alumni. So that's definitely a privilege to be in this space. Well, I love that you shared that with us because it really helps illuminate that you're walking this walk every day. You're not just, you know, working off of a, a curriculum and, and telling everybody they can do it. You you do that as well. But the reality- I do it. I, yeah. do it. I face the challenges that each and every one yeah. of our colleagues face um, in our virtual space. So I am no stranger to challenges, but most importantly, I can definitely enjoy the, the benefits and the um, intrinsic reward of those days when you have significant successes and impact. I love it. Well, let's, before we get going much further, um, do a little bit of housekeeping. I want to make sure that we extend our gratitude to our presenting sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, where Shonda, LaShonda joins us from, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Lots of amazing support that helps us get on the air every day. If you want to get access to any of our nearly 1,000 episodes, you can download our app. You can find us on streaming broadcast platforms as well as podcast platforms. Okay, this is a really interesting, interesting question that has come in. Um, and obviously, we took off the name. We took off the community. It is a very, very interesting um, epic time to have these discussions. And so I'm going to lead in with this question. I have been accused by a coworker of being racist. This came from a coworker who's African American and lesbian. I'm white and straight. This has just gutted me, and I'm so horrified. My sister is lesbian, and I have an amazing relationship with her. I did not want to use that in my defense. I seriously don't know what to do. And we don't have an HR department. Gosh, that yeah. is a lot. 
That is a lot to unpack. We are diving right in, Julia. Thank you so much. Um, I, I mentioned turn up earlier. The heat. <laughs> yeah, you turned up the heat. Like I feel the wildfires over here. No pun intended. Um, well, that is definitely a very interesting situation, and it's an unfortunate situation. Um, no one in any workplace, whether it be the nonprofit sector, for profit, or any service, you know, industry period, would want to be accused of being racist. So I would say, in the absence of HR, there are a couple of things that come to mind immediately. The first is, you know, we talk about the importance of um, creating relationships. And as development professionals, we're taught to participate in active listening. So if um, the individual is willing to have a conversation with you and you're okay with just the two of you and not having to have a mediator, I would suggest creating an opportunity where you both can have a conversation and be able to share authentically. But because you are being accused of such an allegation, I would focus on listening. And, you know, one of the other things I think about in the fundraising world is when there's an, an incident that we are often encouraged to apologize if there is an issue. And so apologize for whatever that perception is, because unfortunately, perception is reality, but also ask for the opportunity to um, provide clarity on whatever concerns that that individual may have. And then I definitely see an opportunity to reach out to your board if you have a board in place or volunteers to find out if there are any HR professionals that will be willing to provide some training for your unit. Um, it's very important, not certain what your budget is, but in the absence of HR and in the current climate in which we live in, and we want to make sure that we're respectful. And because of this type of allegation, I would highly recommend identifying an HR professional and or someone whose specialty is um, in DEI to come to provide some professional development and training you know, professional development is one thing when I'm just kind of giving you um, insight on what the specs are, but training provides an, an added layer, which means that you have an opportunity to engage in some experiential types of conversations so that you can see clarity. Because in many instances in which um, individuals are, you know, accused or have allegations of being racist, it could be simply um, as simple as because there are some cultural differences and misinterpretations. And I'm not going to and I, I'm going to deviate from the word misinterpretation. Let me dial back. Because in some instances, there are cultural differences. There are also interpretation differences from learned experiences. So the only way we can clarify things is by having conversations that are authentic and that are safe um, and that are respectful. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm fascinated with the difference between training and professional development. I, I've never really thought of it that way. And I like, I like what you you said there because, you know, we look at professional development oftentimes for a small sector within our organizations and we don't, you know, bring people maybe from facilities management or the clerical staff or the cafeteria, whatever. Right. I mean, we, we don't do that. And so I love that you've, you've kind of navigated those two pieces. Um, I also think if if you don't have an HR department, but you feel like this is something that is just bigger than two people, yes. um, you know, this might be a good time to reach out to some other nonprofits in your community and do a training, training where you can pull your resources um, because this is not a topic that's going away and it can build a lot of heartache within an organization and make everybody miserable, want to leave, maybe change jobs. I mean, whereas if we can get together and to your point, you know, do some uh, directed and, and led conversations. Definitely. But because it can become toxic, you know, that environment does not foster a culture of trust nor an opportunity for individuals to thrive in. And it can be detrimental to the organization. Yeah. And hurtful to um, the whole mission, to your point of just becoming the big, big picture or the big issue of an organization and leading them away from their mission. Right. I exactly. Mean, it's such an interesting thing. You know, um, I appreciate you talking about this with us and, and giving us some ideas. I think this is going on more and more and we don't talk about it, 
we talk about DEI and we talk about, you know, trying to change our work cultures, but yet when things arrive <laughs> to the front door of our organization, <laughs> Then it's like, yeah. oh my God, well, what do we do? Right. <laughs> exactly. So um also I'm thinking too, LaShonda, before we go into the next um question, you know, there are fractional HR representatives or companies. So just because you're a small nonprofit doesn't mean you have to, you know, not have HR help. Exactly. Because there are it, plenty of individuals that do contract work, yeah. you know. To be, and, you know, and I'm thinking about, you know, maybe perhaps the organization is has a very modest budget, which is why I'm thinking, you know, thinking about board members and volunteers, those that may know HR professionals that are willing to um, to do some work with them gratis and or become a part of their board. You know, when you're thinking about board dynamics and um, the various areas of expertise, it sounds like this is an opportunity to identify some individuals in the human resources area to perhaps um, that is aligns with your organization, they can lend that expertise to you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's a really interesting thing. And and I, I, I think that it's um, no shame in, in moving forward on this and not trying to sweep it under the, the carpet. I mean, if, if anything, you know, when, when we talk about these things, it's super uncomfortable, but at the end of the day, it builds our organizations, I think, and, and our teams within our organizations. And so, I mean, you know, this is one thing too, you have to think about your clients. And if this is going on internally, what are you projecting to your clients? Are you using the inappropriate, um, you know, nomenclature or attitudes towards your clients, right? I mean, it, it, it's not just within, you know, the accounting department in the back room. I mean, it could be exactly, you know, and, and that's why I'm like, it, that's the, you know, the training is paramount. You know, we have, um, we're fortunate to have, to be a private institution in the state of Texas. And so we do have um, a DEI center that's been funded by one of our alumni. And every month, you know, Donna does a phenomenal job in introducing various aspects of DEI because many people tend to think that DEI is just simply limited to race or, you know, um, areas in which we prescribe to, but there's a lot more um, to DEI. So I definitely would continue to reiterate yeah. professional development and training yeah. both in tandem. Love it. Well, thank you. That's that's a cool thing to, to, um, to have discussed. And, and I hope that we get to hear back on what the outcome is. I really, really do. Um, okay, let's go to Kyle from Los Angeles. And Kyle writes in, I have a high profile donor and I want to give her a tour of our campus. I also want to take her to lunch at our cafeteria. It will be, it will not be what she is used to. Should I take her out to another restaurant that is more in her sphere? <laughs> Oh, I just, this is heartwarming, Kyle. It is heartwarming because I love, you know, being immersed in the culture and having a genuine, authentic experience. So I'm going to say a couple of things. There's a couple of things that come to mind immediately. You know, although this individual is a high profile donor, how committed are they to your organization? Because if they're completely committed to your organization and you already have established that buy-in, that linkage, then I think that this would be a really enchanting experience for that individual. Mm -hmm. um, because they're high profile, they're very accustomed to things in their sphere. And so sometimes it's really great to have that experience that's outside of what we're traditionally exposed yeah. to, which could create even larger opportunities beyond what you have already um, discussed with that individual, meaningful experiences matter. And when you want to engage donors, prospective donors, they want to they want to make sure that their funds are not only spent according to how they've requested, but that you're being very mindful. And so I think that in this particular instance, without having all of the details, that you could not possibly go wrong with inviting them to the cafeteria so that they can mm -hmm. have a meaningful experience. And what I would also add is, um, depending on what type of organization it is, 
invite some of your colleagues and or said beneficiaries to perhaps join you for that lunch. Now, obviously you want to make sure that you prep them a little bit um, and you can provide some insight about the donor in terms of um, what they're looking to fund. And you may want to provide some, you know, etiquette training, things of that nature so that everyone feels comfortable. But I think this is a phenomenal experience to connect with the donor at a higher level. Yeah. I love that you said that. Yeah. Making it, you know, more of a community um, environment at that. I'm thinking of that cafeteria style table, right. Or going through the yeah. line. It's I, you know, and I've worked in higher ed most of my life and I know um, two presidents for certain that I've worked with that love to go to the cafeteria, go through the line and wait, just like the students. <laughs> They put away their trays. They would go yeah. sit with the students and that literally those opportunities were highlights of their days. And one in particular um, would on, on Valentine's Day would make his way to the cafeteria and hand out coordinations to the young ladies. I mean, just those types of things really matter. Those are really meaningful touch points. Yeah. Well, and I also think, you know, we, we call this um, dog fooding and that means that you better be eating the food that you're serving. Exactly. You better, you better see what it's like. Um, and maybe it's not great. So maybe that's a call to action. It is know? definitely an opportunity. Definitely. Yeah. So it's, it's I, an opportunity for accolades or call to action, as you said. Yeah, I think it's important. And I think also we work in this to me seems like a fear based question. Like they're afraid to offend the donor. Like it's not up to, to her standards or it's not la di da enough. Well, you know, you, she's probably dealing with a not a la di da topic, right? So this exactly. is exactly and, and that's why she is is connecting with you because she wants to make it better. And again, emerging into the organization and having that experience, that is absolutely priceless. You cannot quantify that. Yeah. And, and something that she will always remember, you know, good, bad, and different. It, it's an opportunity to make her closer to the organization or bring her closer. Right. I love it. Well, Kyle, good luck and be proud. And if it's not working, then that's why you have a donor. And that's why you get community support to solve a problem. And, and so don't try to beautify the cafeteria for this <laughs> one moment in time, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, LaShonda. You're right. Be It's like what you just said. Be authentic and, and be real. Um, okay. So this is another interesting question. And um, I'll fess up. We took the name off. It comes uh, to us from Colorado Springs, Colorado. We have a board chair who does not know how to run a proper meeting. It is frustrating other board members and making me want to quit. What should we do? Wow, Julia. Definitely glad we withheld the name. Um, <laughs> uh, this does not sound unfamiliar. Um, <laughs> so uh, relationships are the heart of fundraising. And oftentimes we are placed in very difficult positions um, where we inherit a board or we're excitable and we create this board without having adequate time to vet. Um, this reminds me specifically of some things that need to take place um, with each and every board every year. And that is a retreat. And with that retreat, that creates the opportunity for um, leadership to discuss what the roles and responsibilities are and training. And, you know, training is non-offensive because you want them to understand the importance of how operations should happen, including in their particular meetings and what the flow is. It sounds like this particular individual may need um, the quick version of Robert's Rules of Order, <laughs> but definitely um, you want to provide tools for success. And that begins with the acknowledgement of we as a collective um, not being accusatory, but we need to do better with management of our meetings so we can be more effective. Um, and then, you know, introducing some strategies at a planning meeting among the board so that it is something that everyone can benefit from, everyone can share and participate in. And most importantly, it'll help alleviate some of the stressors because the individual may not fully understand the impact of the way that they're currently managing the meetings. Right. 
That's a very, you know what, that's a very interesting comment. And um, in my view, I think that a lot of board chairs think that just because they're the board chair, they're going to have a, a more amplified voice and they're right. going to be able to speak. But really, in my mind, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, you know, rule number one is for me, the board chair leads the meeting. And they they navigate the compliance issues, the the fiduciary issue, and the organizational stewardship of that board, right? I and so that doesn't agree. always mean that they have the the opportunity to be speaking and dominating the conversation. They're trying to to navigate the conversation. Exactly. Right? I see them as a facilitator and, you yeah. know, providing guidance and words of wisdom. Um, another recommendation that comes to mind immediately, and this is from a traditional setting of other organizations in which I belong to, and that is, you know, making sure that you have the various roles and responsibilities with said organizations, including a parliamentarian to help with the management of the meetings to ensure that you're handling things in proper guidelines and that you're extending the proper professional etiquettes that should be extended. And, you know, with meetings, sometimes, you know, when individuals have an opportunity to get the floor, we're not mindful of the time. And mm -hmm. that's where that parliamentarian would come into place and in ensuring that, you know, if you're bringing something forward, you have X amount of minutes, and this is already implied, and they're watching the time to ensure that the meeting is able to move forward and be productive. Okay, wow. You just blew my mind because I'm I'm here sitting here going, when was the last time I heard the word parliamentarian? You have not in ages. Oh in, my god. You know, in ages, you know, in, you know, my sorority, I go to sorority meetings, we have parliamentarians and they are definitely on top of things in terms of how meetings should be run and it helps with it being very smooth, um, very efficient and an effective use of your time. You know, I'm thrilled that you brought that up because to me, that is a very Greek system uh, structure. You know, yeah. you, you see that and it's it's male and female. It's not just, you know, one gender or the other. Very, very interesting. And I I love that idea um, to kind of reevaluate that. I agree with Robert's rules of order. It has changed so much. Yes. And, 15 years. It's not as strict. And well, there, there's what they call, you know, Robert Light, <laughs> you, or you, you can do it. But basically, what this comment to me that's so fascinating is that people are busy. And if they don't feel like their time is being well spent, it's much easier to leave and find another, you know, board to serve. There are 1.8 million nonprofits registered in this country. There are a lot of board spots open. <laughs> you know, so people have options so we want to make sure that we are being very effective and efficient yeah okay well we don't have much time left let's get to uh, this question came in very interesting this came in from a committee and we a, a team and we don't often get a group question but i i like this it comes from a fund development team in buffalo new york my team is in fund development we have a team that does marketing and we can't seem to get on the same page. Can you help us figure out a way to communicate with them so we get marketing that helps us? We struggle with their ideas of how best to market to our donors. We know best. Isn't that fascinating? You know, it's so funny. Um, I hear this a lot mm -hmm. in a variety of different spaces. Um, from friends uh, and colleagues alike. Um, I will say that, you know, communication is key. And, you know, one of the things that I have actually seen happen to be pretty effective is having a joint meeting. And with the joint meeting, you know, everyone is prepared, okay? So you're preparing for your joint meeting. And in preparation for the joint meeting, you are given said task. So perhaps it's March and everybody is working on a specific type of um, giving initiative and you would share from your perspective. And when you're sharing from your perspective as to what your role is and your responsibility would be um, as it relates to that particular project, that's the opportunity for the open dialogue and the clarification. And it's also the teachable moment because it creates an opportunity for both parties from both entities to be able to really effectively collaborate together and be able to 
form or craft the story and or the branding um, in accordance to not only the guidelines for branding, but most importantly, being able to have insight on how those stories should be told. Um, you know, there are a variety of different marketing and communications professionals. Some expertise may be um, in technical areas and some may be feature, but it sounds like you need to emphasize the importance of the writing style for when you're engaging donors. And that would be more like feature soft stories as opposed to opposite kind of stories you know you got special interest stories they're a variety of different types but kind of using their their language to um reach them and meeting them where they are and then also you know giving them the specs of what you're looking for i think can create an opportunity to um expand the brand and meet the goals on both sides mm -hmm. you know i think you're right about sitting down and saying you know this is my world this is what i have to do these are the people that i'm speaking to um from both sides, because yes. I think a lot of times what the marketing team thinks of what the donor is, is not accurate. And then I, removed. yeah. And then I think the development team is just like, well, how hard can it be? Send a press release. And it's like, okay, it doesn't work like that anymore. You know, so I exactly. Like what, yeah. I like and what you said, like come together for an, an extensive period of time where you can really lay out what your expectations are and what your yeah. reality is of delivering that service. You you have to be very intentional and you have to have the conversations in order to be able to effectively advance your organization. Um, in previous employment um, employers that I've had, I've worked with marketing and communication in tandem on everything. And so much so that people will be like, where's your office again? Because the collaboration between the two entities, they complement each other. Yeah. If we're able to tell a great, compelling story, we're able to reach um, prospective donors in a very unique and powerful way, mm -hmm. and we're able to advance our cause. Right. I love that. That's brilliant, brilliant um, advice. LaShonda, you always have brilliant advice for us, and it is a joy to spend, um, I should say, start my Friday, but spend time with you. LaShonda Williams, MPA, CFRE. One of the great trainers with uh, Fundraising Academy at National University. If you want to find out more about them, you can go to fundraising-academy.org. Fundraising Academy has this amazing, amazing conference coming up at the first part of May. We will be there broadcasting live. And LaShonda, I'm sure you're going to be on site. And so people will get to meet you and learn more about you um, through some of the sessions as well, just to meet you on the, the convention floor, which is pretty exciting. So I am thrilled that you will be a part of that and that we will be a part of that. Again, we have amazing sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. My friend, I know that you have been working through a lot. I'm so grateful you came today. I know you're just a little under the weather. You know, no one would ever know it. Get off camera, take care of yourself. And we will and I will live well so I can be well. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. And LaShonda's right. Stay well so you can do well.